All right, so we'll continue today with uh, going through our project and learning some of the basic stuff, and then we'll go further. Uh, so before we get started, based on last time, uh, are there any general questions that people kind of ran into or any general ideas that you might have since last time? Any general questions? When you did your, your version of it, it was... Uh, Yes, good question. Good question. So, no, it's not going to be on my website. My code is only going to be in the network folder on this campus, and I'm going to show you where that network folder is again. So, I am putting the the videos up online and such, but the work that I do at the end of every day, I'm going to put it in the network folder in this room. So, you want to make sure you've got a USB to take it with you if you want to take it. I'll show you that network folder in a moment. Any other general questions? Okay, so let me show you again the network folder. This is um, the work from last Tuesday, but we're actually not going to continue with it. But if you want a copy of it on your computer, here you're going to see the computer icon on the top left. Go ahead and double click the computer icon there, top left corner. You'll see a variety of drives, and you'll see a network location section. Under network location, you'll see classroom data drive Z, Z as in zebra. Double click classroom data drive Z. You'll see a lot of folders here alphabetically. Scroll down to find Campos Android 1. Double click that. And so if you're new today, this is where the syllabus is at. You'll have a chance to print it later during the break. But the syllabus is there, and the work that we did together on Tuesday is also listed there. So if you brought a USB drive, you can get a copy of those. And as I said, today we're going to, one more time, start from scratch. We'll do it a couple of times. Uh, we won't start from scratch every single time. Of course, that would be too much of a hassle. But the first few times, we'll, we'll start from the beginning with an empty document, and we'll work with that. But if you'd like the work that I ended up with on Tuesday, it's in the network folder. The only catch is that if you're on your own laptop or tablet and such, you can't access it. You do have to use one of our computers. Uh, I did ask our technician, are we able to give, am I able to give access uh, to my students on their own laptops to the network folder? And the technician basically laughed at me. So, no. <laughs> Vulnerabilities and such. Yes? How do you get the actual code? That's what I'm getting to next. So our process is, here's the HTML file. Well, how do we get back to edit it? The easiest way is if you right-click it, edit with Notepad++. So we're going to use the Notepad++ software. But uh, as again, we're not going to use this as our starting point. So I'm going to close that folder. If you open the September 8th file in Notepad, that's fine, but again, we're not going to use it. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to use uh, Notepad++ to start from scratch one more time. Now, those of you that have a Windows computer at home, how many of you went home and downloaded Notepad++ and maybe used it a little? Okay, good. You, I forget the exact website. It's something like notepadplus.org, something like that. So if you just do a quick search, you should find Notepad++ online. Uh, and if you're on the Mac, does anyone remember what I said if you're a Mac user? Text Wrangler, yes. Those are the two I recommend for this class. But if you like using brackets, thank you, or Sublime Text, or Visual Studio, or Eclipse, or whatever you like to use, that's fine. In this class, we're talking about Notepad++ and Text Wrangler. So here uh, on our computer, go ahead and go to your Start menu. And in the search box down here, search for Notepad++. That is, if you don't have it open, search Notepad++, and we will launch Notepad++. You might get a pop-up about uh, an update. Just cancel that. Question? OK, um, to log back in, the password is lab. So Notepad++ loads up, 
it'll give you some change log info. Well, to retrace our steps from previously, go to File, Menu, New. We get a brand new empty document, which is obviously the best thing and the worst thing for a programmer. It's the best thing because we have infinite possibilities. It's the worst thing because we have infinite possibilities. So uh, we have a brand new document. Let's go to File, Menu, Save As. I brought my USB drive, so I'm going to save it onto my USB drive. And again, at the end of the day, I'll give you a copy of my work, just to compare in case you want it. On my USB drive, I have a folder that I created previously called Android 1. So I'm going to save it in there, and I'm going to call it September 10th. Why not? And save as type, very important, hypertext markup language. So we can edit a variety of code with Notepad++. If you browse that list, we can edit Python code, uh, text, postscript, uh, Lua, JavaScript, etc., etc. C++, C Sharp, Fortran. So you're going to select the Hypertext Markup Language option, and it's going to save as September, or you save it as September 10th. So we've got this blank document. We're going to create this basic skeleton one more time of HTML from scratch. And eventually, we're not going to need to start over and over. We're going to use frameworks. We're going to use templates to get us running quickly. One of those main templates that we're going to look at, one of those frameworks, is called jQuery Mobile. So if you start to research that a little bit, we're going, to, we're going to do it together. But again, we'll start from the beginning with an empty document just to get the practice. Uh, so we'll start with the very first tag. Remember, we're talking about tags, which are the open and close ang angle brackets. And the very first tag at the top defines our document. Exclamation point, D-O-C-T-Y-P-E, space HTML. We're about to create a, an HTML5 standards compliant document. That's what that line means. Next line, we're going to add the HTML tags to define this is what this is what's going to actually appear in my web app. So the HTML uh, opening tag and the HTML closing tag. Other other code editors um, give you perhaps a lot of a lot of code hints. And actually, if you download the latest version of Notepad++, it should also give you code hints, which means it helps you fill in your code so you don't type it incorrectly. I don't know why our version of it doesn't give you code hints. There's probably an option that's not on, even though I thought we had the default version of it. Yes? Um, I know from the last class I took, every night the computers get flashed. Huh. So until you get your technician to update it before the regular computer that pushes out all the Windows copies, then that's the only way they're updated. To my knowledge, these computers don't do that, but they do have deep freeze yeah. in that it forgets everything that you did. But I worked with my technician a few months ago to make, or weeks ago to make sure all the software was updated. So I'm not quite sure. There's probably an option somewhere here that is not on. But have you, if you downloaded Notepad++ yourself at home, did you see your version was auto helping you write your code? No. I don't know. Sometimes I do see it on some installations. But other software too, like uh, Brackets and Sublime Text and stuff, they help you write this code because it might get tedious. And yeah, we're kind of gonna, we're kind of going to do it the, the hard way the first, the first few times, and then we'll do it the easier way. So we've got this HTML document tab inside of HTML line three, so that we can uh, write the head tag, and it's got a pair. The head section is where we write our meta content, as we saw previously, and then body. So I'll go a bit quickly at the moment, because we did see this. It shouldn't be totally new. And you should be practicing writing your code and remembering that there's a slash when we close the tag. And you should recall that we have opening and closing tags, uh, usually. Do you have an example? Just press tab on the keyboard. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. If that's what it remembers, the second rate file. So go to the file menu. Yeah. And then you need all of this. And all these files it has. Oh. So you can that can be one of them. Because it remembers the last file. So oh, okay. Oh. So now call it once it comes return. Oh. And then you can say that it's type of the digital. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do it automatically. So there's some other creators do close it for you. Curious. Hardly what you do is the most curious. All right, so uh, here's what we've got so far. We've got the doc type and the HTML head and body sections. Uh, this is our document so far. Um, up on the head section, we're going to define our character set, which means what are the possible uh, alphabets and symbols and such we can use in this document. So we'll back up to the head section, press enter and tab. Remember the tabs are optional. It doesn't uh, matter to HTML, basically, if you use tabs and spaces. But we're using tabs and indentation and such for readability. So here we'll write another tag. This is uh, a self-closing tag, meaning it doesn't have a pair. And it's the meta tag, M-E-T-A. The meta tag defines a variety of extra features of our page, of our site. But it, what it does, it needs uh, our attributes. So there's a bunch of terminology. One of the important terminologies is when we're defining a meta tag, it might have extra properties and features. Technically, the term is attributes. The meta tag has an attribute. If you recall, inside of the meta tag, the angle brackets, what was our attribute? Anyone remember previously? Car set. C-H-A-R-S-E-T. Car set. Char set, if you want to say it wrong. Car set equals, and then we did quote, end quote. Now sometimes when you see tutorials and they talk about um, perhaps an attribute, it's got the attribute equals, and sometimes on tutorials you see single quotes, apostrophes. Those are two actually valid ways to do it. Either the double quote, like that, or the single quote. Both will work. Sometimes you see the, the single quote, the apostrophe. Well, technically not an apostrophe. Technically the, you know, the inch or the foot symbol. Um, sometimes you see that one because it's faster to type, isn't it? You're typing and you just do tap tap. You've got the apostrophe. The other way you have to hold shift and then the symbols. I'm kind of in the habit of doing the double quotes, but either way is fine. If you previously have learned any HTML and in there you learned the single quote, fine, keep doing it. But I'm usually going to use these double quotes. Car set. And we said we wanted to use the uh, UTF-8 character set, which includes all the letters in English and Spanish and Cyrillic and Hebrew and Japanese, etc. Symbols, copyright symbol, yen symbol. The heart symbol, we can, we can draw a very simple heart. Not emoji, the emoji is in a different character set, but that's why we define a character set to say what kind of characters can we use on our project. And so we've done a lot of hard work so far. We don't want to lose it. Let's save our work. Yes? I believe there's an option to activate auto-save, but by default it's not on. So the closest is that it reminds us up here because this little floppy disk is red. We haven't saved, so you want to save that. But I believe there is an auto-save option somewhere in the options. So go ahead and save your work. You can go to File, Save, Control-S, or click the, the Save icon.
The next item in the head section, line 5, is the title tag. And this one I'm going to keep it on a single line. Remember, it, it doesn't care if we put our tags in separate lines or single lines. But as I said, the way I like to do it, and it's not right or wrong, but the way I like to do it, especially if I'm only displaying one piece of content, is to keep it on one line. I could put title, space, title, or title, enter, title, but I'm keeping it on one line just to save a few bytes and a little bit of space visually. And the title of our project today will be September 10th. And if you remind me, where does this text appear on our website if we view it in the web browser? The tab. The tab at the top of the browser. It's meta content. It appears outside of the main area of the web browser, which has a name, which I'll get to in a moment. But that appears in the tab of the web browser, the title. We'll go now over to the body section, make a new line 8, tab. And we'll do a heading number 1, H1. That will display my content nice and big. And we'll say hello world again. So those 10 lines are enough of a skeleton, enough of a reiteration of what we did previously. This is just to remind ourselves again how, how our workflow will be. We're going to use Notepad++. We're going to write our code in Notepad++. We're going to save our work. And then how do we render this? How do we make this actually look like a website again? Go up to the Run menu. Run, Launch. And then you, whatever web browser you want. And I'm choosing Firefox, just because it's the first one up there. You notice there's also a handy keyboard shortcut. Control Alt Shift X. Maybe not so handy, but there is a keyboard shortcut for it. And you know, with practice, you will you can actually use one hand to launch Firefox if you use all your fingers. So make sure you've saved your work. If the disk, if the floppy disk icon up here is still red, that means you haven't saved, and you might not get the result that you expect. So make sure you've saved, and then run launch Firefox, or Chrome, or whatever you like to use. I just want to see my work result. Here we go, September 10th, at the title. A nice big bold hello world again at the top, because it's a heading 1. That was a bit of a recap of last time. This is my code so far. Did that work for everyone? Does anyone need a little help? All right, so we saw this previously, uh, and we we um, talked about that basically we'll have three pillars, three languages that we're going to be using throughout the course, especially when we get more complex as an app. And as I said previously, we're going to develop an Android app, and we're going to use three languages, HTML, HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. Those are our three pillars of what our app will eventually be. And in month one, we're going to end up with a web app. So we have to learn how to crawl before we learn how to walk, before we learn how to run. And so um, what I want to do here is uh, add a couple more little HTML things for content and structure, and then we'll talk about CSS for presentation, and then we'll get to JavaScript for interactivity. So let's make a note here, actually. I want to make a note in my document. Does anyone remember? What do we what do we write to write notes or comments inside of our tag, inside of our code? Explanation point type in question, and then close it with Perfect. So we're going to we're going to add 
the comment tag. It can be added anywhere, but I'm going to add it uh, after the body tag, before the closing HTML tag. So give yourself a brand new line 10. And remember the comment tag is a little bit of a weird one, but it's the angle bracket dash dash, angle bracket exclamation point dash dash, space dash dash, angle bracket. And now whatever's inside of those tags, of that tag unit, will be a comment. Well, I want to break this into a few multiple lines. That's valid. Question? Um, could you explain exactly what is comment? Yes, I did so uh, previously, but I'll mention it again, that a comment is any code that the web browser is going to ignore. So we're writing a comment here because we're going to write ourselves some notes, and therefore the web browser will ignore that code. And so the notes that I want to write here are um, just a little bit of a blurb about um, that this is my project and the date and so forth, because as we get more complex with our apps, our websites and such, it's good to, to have some of this information. So we're going to add the comment tag, and I'm going to write name, project, date, version. This is totally optional but I'm writing some comments for myself because I may be working on this project for a while or I may be working with a group of people and uh, I need to be on the same page with people. So under name here, you can write your name. The name of this project is simply basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Today's date, however you want to write it. And on version code, uh, version number here, we can be totally fancy and say this is version 1.0.1. A-001. Doesn't matter. Version numbers don't matter. But I'm just saying we can write any version number here. I'm also going to use this comment block at the bottom to make myself a note again. So a couple of spaces here. We can get fancy and put some dashes. Again, this is all going to be ignored by the web browser. This is for human eyes. Um, the web browser will not take this as code and will not do anything with it. And what I want to write here is, again, the three pillars of our project. HTML, CSS, JavaScript. HTML is for our structure. Well, let me use the terms that my recommended book says, just so that we're on track. In this book, remember, this is one of the recommended books in the syllabus, the, J, the JavaScript and jQuery Interactive Frontend Web Design. It's also used in other classes on this campus. Very good book, although it doesn't seem to be very sturdy because mine's falling apart. Uh, but let me just use some of the terms from there. The HTML is going to be our content layer, which I would continue to mention as previously for structure. We've written some HTML which has our structure of our site, right? The head section, the body section, a, a, a heading one. We can do bullet points, we can do a table, we can do all of this content and structure. HTML is our content layer. And we've got CSS, which is the presentation layer. Uh, and the presentation is uh, our design our design layer, uh, the look and feel of it, the user interface, the colors, uh, you know, drop shadows and other sort of presentation aspects, user interface. So CSS is, is, regard, is related to that. It affects the presentation of the project, how it looks. 
And then JavaScript is our behavior layer. which I called last time interactivity. You click on a button, it does something. Maybe you get a pop-up window, maybe you get um, some math calculations that give you a result. Um, you click uh, a button or you hover over something and something else happens, that's the interactivity, that's the behavior. So these are the three languages, the three pillars, the three languages of our project. And those are the three languages, the three, pro uh, the three pillars of our project, and many modern websites and apps, of course. So even in our whole three-month-long uh, three class, we're not going to have the time to delve into every single aspect of all of these three languages. That's a big endeavor. So we'll learn as much as we can about each one as, as necessary to create our projects. So I want to add a little more content to my project, which means I want to add a little more HTML to my project. But any questions so far? Okay, so... Currently, some of the content that I have up here simply says hello world again as a heading one tag. Uh, I'm going to add a paragraph tag. So that's the P tag. That one usually a paragraph has more than one line, so I'm dividing it into P tag starts here, P tag ends here. So that's why I divided it like that. But I could have kept it on one line. All right, today we'll explore HTML and CSS more. Remember that if we want to separate our, our lines, like I've got in the syllabus, we've got a section and another section, and they're separate. Uh, we, each one of these could be a paragraph. But let's say I wanted to sort of do a soft return to move to my next line, but I'm still in a paragraph. Does anyone remember that tag to break this line? BR. So at the end of that line, we'll add the BR tag, and that's one of the tags that is uh, a self-closing uh, tag, meaning it doesn't have a pair. Most tags have a pair. BR does not. Meta does not. Doctype does not. But most other tags do have a pair. And I want to add a break here because I want to add a new line. Press enter there. I'm still within the same paragraph, but now I've broken to the next line visually, and I want to say check out this bullet point list. Uh, we didn't see this last time. I want to make uh, a bullet point list. Uh, so for example, part of the syllabus, there was, a, uh, there was a page on the syllabus that had these bullet points. We can render bullet points with HTML as well. Let's take a, a bit of time to create a bullet point list. So it's going to need tags again. After the paragraph, after the paragraph group or section there, press enter. Uh, I'm on line 13. Again, your lines may not be the same as mine, that's okay. But I'm on line 13 after my P tag before the end of body. And bullet points, it would make perfect sense to have some sort of tag called bullet point or something. But uh, when this was being invented, they didn't call it bullet points. The tag is not simply called bullet points. The tag is actually called UL. And the bullet points do have a pair, so slash UL. UL is going to make sense. Why do they call it UL? It's going to make sense when we talk about the other kind of bullet points in a moment. So hold off on why is it called UL in a moment. But this is going to start a set of bullet points. So here I've got several bullet points. 
each item is an item in my bullet point list. So here I'm defining bullet points, and now I need to define each item in my bullet point list. So tab inside of UL, the bullet points list, and then we have to list every item of the bullet points. We have to then add the LI tag. This is going to be one bullet point, actually. This is going to be a collection of bullet points, UL to slash UL, and each bullet point itself will be an LI, list item. This means unordered list. This is list item. Again, this will make sense. Unordered list? Well, it'll make sense once we compare with the other bullet point list. But the first bullet point here um, will say uh, a bullet list of items of... Um, of, um, I don't know, we'll do cell phone manufacturers. Let's do Apple. We want another list item, so press enter, and you'll have to say another list item. Samsung. So as many as we want. List item, one more. We'll do uh, HTC. Each one of these is a bullet point item, a list item, inside of an unordered list, a collection of bullet points. Let's go ahead and save this file, run it in Firefox, and let's see what it looks like. Yes? Is there a way to copy paste all of those, like you have a long list rather than type them all? There's the standard selecting, right-clicking, copy and paste, yes, but, there, but the smarter way that you probably mean about adding more in a faster way, not quite. Uh, with plain old HTML, with JavaScript there is. That's part of that interactivity. With JavaScript, we can write code that will automatically make a list for us, continue to add more to it based on user input and such. But at our point of knowledge, short answer is no, just copy and paste. Yes? Why did you put that outside of the paragraph tag? I wanted to separate it. I don't want this list item to be part of that paragraph. I want it to be a separate logical unit. So we'll talk about the purpose of tags and also the meaning of tags and the use of tags. So I could have kept this bullet point list inside of that same paragraph, but I want to separate it for various purposes. One of them will be regarding styling it with CSS a little bit later. So let's save this. Make sure you've saved. Go back up to Run Launch Firefox. Look at that. We've got that paragraph. Today we'll explore HTML and CSS. We've got a break. Next line. Check out this bullet point list. An extra space because the paragraph ended. And then bullet points. List item 1, list item 2, list item 3, list item infinity. Apple, Samsung, HTC. So for every bullet point we would need its own list item, LI. Now watch this. Change UL slash UL. Change that to OL slash OL. Save it and launch it and see what happens. OL, not 0L. OL, and that's an L, not a 1. OL. What happens with OL? Make sure both of them get changed to OL. What happens? If you simply change it to OL, now you have an ordered list. It has an order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, infinity. Therefore, an unordered list is just bullet points. UL is an unordered list, bullet points. OL is an ordered list, 1, 2, 3. So an OL, an ordered list, would be great uh, well, let's say a UL, an unordered list, would be great for a list of ingredients. I need uh, sugar, and I need flour, and I need butter, etc. But then an OL would be great for the, uh, for the steps on how to bake those cookies. Make sure you mix the eggs and the sugar first, one, and then mix that with the flour second, or else you'll get a mess. So OL, ordered list, it's 
items in order. UL is unordered list, just bullet points. Is there a way to change the bullet point style in the unordered list? There is. All of this has a default behavior like we've seen previously, and then via CSS, we'll be able to change it to be, let's say, Roman numerals, or number Arabic num uh, numerals 1, 2, 3, or letters A, B, C, capital and lowercase. So via CSS, we'll be able to change the style of the, of the unordered list, or the ordered list. Maybe instead of little circles for unordered list, I want squares, or check marks, or your company logo. That's through CSS. That's the presentation layer of things. The content itself is through HTML. And how does it actually look or perhaps behave? CSS, JavaScript. That's why they have those three languages. HTML itself cannot accomplish everything. What's that? So we've got an, un we've got an ordered list now. Why don't we add a comment here? UL is unordered list, which is bullet points. OL is ordered list which is numbers. Or the numbers can be changed to Roman numerals and letters and so forth later. But that's something new we didn't see last time. Bullet points. Yes? You're saying specifically if I put the li tag up here? Oh, um, or the comment tag? Inside the comment, uh -huh. you put the tag, but it was just for your own reference. But if you put it in something that wasn't a comment, would it show? Uh -huh. It would try to show it, yes. Because I put it in the comment, it's going to ignore it as valid code. It thinks it's just a comment, human readable. But any tag that is outside of a comment, it will try to display it as the proper way. And if you put a tag that shouldn't be in the right place, you might get really weird results. But yes, it'll try to display this as a valid UL tag if you put it up here and things will look really weird. Okay, so um, let's look at another tag here. This one's going to be very useful. Um, we have a tag that is a generic container because this will make more sense once we actually start looking at CSS. Remember, CSS is about the presentation of things, the design, the style, the color, the layout, and such, CSS. And there's a tag that is a generic container that we can put stuff into and then style it, position it, give it a drop shadow, and then maybe use JavaScript to make it animate and flip and do that stuff. And we'll, we'll often use this generic container. Uh, so after the OL, um, after our ordered list here, we will add this tag called div, D-I-V. I believe it's short for division. Oops, just div, slash div. Div, it's a division. It's basically, this is a section of content. But the thing is that it's a generic container. Uh, later, via CSS, we will be able to uh, control it and position it, colorize it, etc. Uh, we will use this much more extensively later on, but I want to introduce it now because it's a pretty useful. Uh, it's a pretty useful tag. All of these tags have a built-in meaning. The body tag obviously has the meaning to display my main website. 
Uh, the ol tag has the meaning that it's an ordered list. The p tag has a meaning that it's a paragraph. div is one of the ones that doesn't have much meaning really, but we give it meaning with other with other code and other tags. But it can also we can sort of think about it vaguely in a sense as a paragraph, but it's going to be sort of like a, like a lump of clay that we can mold it into things. So simply we'll put div here. Um, this is a div. We'll style it with CSS. So the h1 tag, the heading 1 tag, had a meaning that it's a heading, just like uh, this page in my book right here. This would be the heading 1, big, bold, and important. But this particular font can be manipulated, and the size can be manipulated via CSS. But heading one had an inherent design, an inherent meaning. The div doesn't have an inherent meaning. It has a basic design, but we can control that design via CSS, which we'll do a little later. Yes? Um, can you show me on the screen the end of the column, the second column? Please? Doesn't quite fit on my screen. So we have a little bit of content with HTML. Now let's write a little bit of CSS to actually make it look interesting because right now it's basically black and white, kind of boring. And previously we added some CSS um, to, our, to our document, uh, but we added one of the three kinds that I mentioned. And, and does anyone remember specifically the name of that kind of CSS? If not, that's okay. Let's do this. Inline. Yes, good memory. Good memory. Let's do this. Let's go back to our comment section. Um, I'm going to make this space and maybe another comment area down here. And I'll write the three kinds of CSS. Inline. I always forget the other one. I think it's embedded and external. We wrote inline CSS previously, which is added to specific elements, specific tags. We went to the h1 tag itself and added CSS style directly to that one heading tag. That was inline. We added it to that one specific tag. Right now we're going to look at embedded, which is added to the document as a whole. We're going to add this, we're going to add these CSS rules, the CSS code, to affect the whole document. It's embedded in this document as a whole. And then the third kind that we'll see eventually, added to a separate, separate, separate linked document. Inline is the quick and dirty way to do things, but it's not recommended because you're adding presentation CSS to a very specific part of the document. And when you've got a 20-line document, a 20-line project, that's not so bad. But when you've got a 200-line document, 2,000-line document, you're going to be hunting around in your code. Where did I edit that style? Uh, and searching around and trying to find the place in your lines of code where you added that specific style. Embedded is a little bit better because all of the CSS rules, all of the CSS code will sort of be stored in one central location at the top of my document. So I can access all my CSS styling in one place at the top of my document. But 
if I have this file, September 10th, and it's linked to September 9th, and I jump from September 10th to September 8th, um, that style that I had defined in September 10th does not automatically go into September 8th. So September 8th will look boring black and white again, whereas September 10th will have colors and drop shadows and gradients. Because I embedded my code in only one document, it's only applying to that one document. So the third kind of CSS that we'll see is external. I can save all my CSS rules, all my CSS definitions, in one separate file, and I can link that file to 20 documents. That one CSS file linked to 20 HTML documents. And therefore, if I edit anything in that CSS file, it will automatically then trickle down to all the 20 HTML documents. They'll all look the same. They'll all behave the same. If I need to make a change later, okay, now I want a blue background instead of a pink background. It was a boy, actually. So we're going to edit that one external file that is linked to 20 other files. And when you make that change, those changes automatically get inherited by the other HTML documents. Usually that's the best way. You have all your CSS code in one central repository, one file, link to all your HTML files, and then they will all look consistent and you can edit them all quickly. So we used inline CSS previously, we did it quickly and it worked, but that's often not the best way because it's limiting. We'll look at embedded now and then it's pretty easy to go to the next level which is external. And it might not quite make sense at the moment, but that's why we'll do it, and the more we do these things, the more they should make sense. So what I want to do is I want to change the default look of my project. Right now it's basic black and white. I want to change those default colors. So let's go back to our head section and we're going to write some CSS code in here. That's where our central location of our embedded CSS code will exist. So after, after the line about title, give yourself a new line 6, press enter, line 6, we're going to write the script tag, uh, not st the style, style tag. So everything that I put between these tags will be CSS code, which will affect the look of my, of my uh, HTML file, this one HTML file, even if it's 200 lines long, 2,000 lines long. And so the way this works is I've got this opening and closing style tag, and in between the style tag, what I'm going to do is create various CSS selectors, that's the official name, selectors. Uh, I also often call them rules uh, or definitions. These are the rules. These are the selectors. This is what affects the look of the design of my project. Previously, we added a CSS selector directly to body. Remember, we went to body and we wrote, uh, we add the, added the attribute style equals background color. Well, we're going to do that same sort of thing, but in the central location, so all of our CSS code, all of our CSS rules, selectors, are in one central location. Um, so inside of the style section, we're going to say, okay, let's change the look of the body tag. The default body is a white background, black text. So inside of style here, we're going to write body, space, curly brace, which is... Uh, Next to the P, you're going to hold shift, you've got a, a square bracket or square brace next to the P, but you're going to hold shift and you're going to get a curly brace or curly bracket, space, curly brace, closed. So opening and closing curly braces, curly brackets, however you want to call them. And now we're about to say, let's change the look of the body like this. This is the selector. We're selecting the body and we're going to change it via CSS. And just like before, we can say body, I'm sorry, we can say background dash color. That should sound familiar. Previously, we changed the background color of the body, but we wrote it in the body tag. Here, we're writing it up on this section. In this syntax, 
What's our selector? What are we what are we controlling? Open close curly brace. The specific um, the specific property that we're affecting of the body is the background color. And then we write a colon space. And then uh, simply previously we gave it a color like red. Remember red was big and bright and ugly. But uh, you can choose any color, like maybe pink, semicolon. So just to make sure it's working so far, because things can easily go wrong. Remember, one character wrong in your code could break your whole site. So let's just see if this works so far. There's a few things that could have gone wrong so far. So let's save our work. Let's launch it. Let's run it. Let's see if you get a nice pink Pepto-Bismol approved background color. Alright, did that work for everyone? Anyone need some help so far? So this is embedded CSS. We've embedded it in one section of the one central section of this document. Here I would write a variety of rules, a I would write a variety of selectors to affect the properties and values of the document. We can also write comments in this style section. Um, but the comments actually um, are a different format. We've written comments of HTML, which are defined like this in CSS. It's written like this. Let me just confirm. Yes. Um, in CSS, our comments look like this. We have a slash, an asterisk, and space, and then whatever comments we want to write, and then an asterisk, and then a slash. So that behaves basically like our HTML comments. Yes, the different languages have slightly different comment styles, but their purpose is to, to, write, to allow us to write comments that are not uh, rendered by the web browser. Question. Um, do you have to put a space in between the S and the asterisk and then the F and the asterisk? I don't believe so. Let me confirm. But I usually do just for it to be readable. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like it cares because I don't see it. If it didn't work, I would see the, that gibberish on screen. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like it matters. But I usually do add the space just to be able to read it. And that um, follows the line just at the end of the code? It, will that what? For HTML, it will work as well. Like you don't have to put the space. Uh, I think it's for this one. For the title. Uh, up here. Yeah, you didn't put the space. You mean the enter? Um, for the title, the beginning of the tag, and then in between the bracket and the S in September, you didn't put a space. I didn't put that space. Yeah. It, would that mess up? No, that one, um, no, not really. That wouldn't, I think it would add an extra space before your letter S here, um, but it wouldn't really be detrimental. Um, thank you. Yes? Is it the uh, um, comment, is it interchangeable with HTML? Is it Unfortunately, no. The, uh, if, you write this, if you write this comment over here in HTML, it won't understand that it's a comment and it'll show it on screen. No, the other way around, you write HTML up there in, in CSS. Let me confirm. I, I often forget, but it's easy just to check it. Let me check it here. So I've, I've written an HTML comment up here, and I've written in a CSS comment down there. Let's see what happens. See, it ignored, uh, it ignored that CSS comment in my HTML. And um, I guess it also, I guess it did use the HTML comment. It was valid up on my CSS because I don't see it up there. So I guess you can write the HTML code. I usually don't. I usually write that kind of comment in CSS because that comment is also consistent in JavaScript. 
this HTML comment is not consistent in JavaScript. So I'm just used to using the, the, the CSS comment style in JavaScript, and I'm using the HTML comment style only in HTML. But it looks like we can use the HTML comment also in CSS. So when you say when you say style, you're actually going into the CSS language. And so everything within the style means has to be in the CSS language as opposed to having an HTML in it. Yes, exactly. Anything inside of the style section, the style tags, is basically CSS language with its own syntax and, and usage and such. So the, what I was uh, going to write here in this comment was I was going to break down the terminology of what did we actually write here. So what we've got there is first we've got a selector. Selector is the first item. Then we've got the curly braces. And inside of there we can have a, a variety of properties. And then we have a value and a semicolon. So the syntax, this is basically the syntax of, of CSS. We have a selector, um, the curly braces, which that also has technically a name. That's a declaration block. We're declaring various properties and values of the selector. And the selector is to select pieces of the document. We can make a selector for heading 1 and P and div, etc. Um, we'll get to that. But basically what that is is the anatomy of a CSS rule or a CSS declaration. There's a selector. It's got various properties and values. Because here we've defined only a background color, but remember previously we could also define the text color. And that was because that semicolon there terminates this particular property. If we go back to body and then add a space and say color, um, brick, semicolon. Now the, not brick, what's it called? Red brick? No, what's it called? Uh, fire brick? Well, red. Um, we have another property separated by semicolons. We can have as many as we want. And we have, according to the specification, like 200 CSS rules that we can uh, apply to our project. And so we just separate them with semicolons. A colon here to say this is the property and its value, and here's another property and its value, separated with semicolons. Yes? So when you type color, that just defaults to the text color? Yes. No one had the good idea to call it text color. They chose color. Background color makes sense, but color is text color. So it's the same sort of syntax, properties and values separated with semicolons. And uh, as we get more complex, you will often see something like this. You don't have to do this, but you'll often see something like this. You'll see it separated by different lines just to be able to read it. That's the same. That's also valid. We've got a selector. We've got the opening brace, the closing brace, and then we've got the particular property and value, semicolon, enter, next line, next line, next line. That works the same. That's a little bit more readable than the, than the one long line. They both accomplish the same thing, but as we get more complex, we'll often do it this way, just because uh, it's easier to read and, and people kind of hate scrolling over. But looking line by line is much better to deal with. I'm going to put that back, and we will do uh, multi-line in, in a moment, but I just want to show this as a single line as uh, this selector. So, yes? So all the CSS is going to be in the little curly bracket, then, is that correct? Yes, the syntax of our, of our CSS is that it needs the curly bracket. Question? Um, but if it's in line, you weren't utilizing the curly bracket. If we were, if we were in line, we were not. So just to remind ourselves, don't do this, but we did inline, and that was with this format. But that one also had background-color, um, blue, semicolon. Which actually gives me, brings me a good point. Will my page, if I save it and run it, 
Will my page be blue or pink? How many of you say pink? How many of you say blue? Okay, if you do, why? How many of you will how many of you will say a nice blended pink plus blue? In line overrides global. That's a good way to put it. So if you're if you're curious, let me run it. It's blue. Uh, a couple of things happened here. So I defined my body color as pink and it obeyed. But then right away on the following code, I said, never mind, make it blue. So um, that's the... What's that? One of the reasons, yes. It came after. So what we witnessed here is the CSS, cascading style sheets. A style sheet. Okay, the sheet is that if it's in a file, cascading is, or a style, is that it defines the look of it, and the cascading is that it does depend on the order of things. So this one came after, and therefore it superseded this one. And also, because it's inline, it supersedes it further. This, is, this one takes more precedence. The inline takes more precedence than the embedded, than the external. Yes? Can you negate the inline after you've done it? Can you say, well, can you defer to the global by having a statement that says um, something like ignore the inline? Usually, uh, you would do that through JavaScript. JavaScript could could trump that or or disrupt the cascade. Via JavaScript, we can make it say, "Go back to paying attention to the embedded one," so to speak. So yeah, through JavaScript. But basically, it's going to be the order. Uh, this is rendered. This is dealt with by the web browser, top to bottom, uh, left to right. So starting from the top, the web browser will read the title tag and process it, then the style tag and the body left to right, keep going, and then it'll go to the, to the body tag itself, read that left to right, and then it sees there's a brand new color, so then that'll override the previous body selector. So inline. <clears throat> um, so basically the order we have it written here is the specificity of it. How specific it is, and which overrides the other. The inline overrides embedded, and the embedded overrides the external. There's actually a fourth one that we almost never use nowadays. There's in, there's a um, uh, there's a there's the built-in uh, well four then I guess uh, five. But there's uh, you can define a user can define their own style sheets on their own computer they can go into the settings of their web browser and define their own style sheets no one really does that but a user could say make my text all the time always yellow and that will supersede always but almost no one does that how many of you knew that you could define your own style sheets in your own web browser here no one so most people don't even know that so we're not worried about it but this is the order inline embedded external and we've written an embedded, we've written ex we've, we've written embedded and inline, and later we'll write external. But at this point, let's write one more selector, then we'll take a break. Um, let me take this back. Uh, I wrote the body selector. Notice um, what I like about Notepad++ is that if you select uh, if you if you select an element in in your code, it will highlight other instances of it throughout your code. So this is one way to quickly find your way throughout your code. So I highlighted the the body selector in the style section, the style declaration section, and it highlighted. Oh, there's your body tag right there. And that's really useful when you've got 500 lines to work with because then you'll see the highlighted code as you select it. Let's say now, uh, after my comment here, now I want to control, I want to change what my heading 1 looks like. By default, it's black and white again, but I want to change what that looks like. So I'll just write another selector, another style rule, another definition to override the default of heading 1 same syntax. I'm going to say this tag, the heading 1 tag, 
opening curly brace. This time, just to, for a little difference, I'm going to break it up into multiple lines. Heading one, open curly brace, close curly brace. And then inside of that, tab. And then I'll kind of do the same thing. Background, dash color. So right now, everything is inheriting the pink color background and the red color text. But then now I'm saying, OK, let's make the heading one with its own background color. In this case, I'll do opposite. I'll do a red background color, semicolon, enter. And then a text color, which is color, pink, semicolon. Save it and launch it. Now you'll see that only in the heading one do we have this rule in effect. The selector is only selecting the heading one, and it's changing its properties and values. That could all be on one line, but I just divided it up to be able to read it a little clearer. So then you should see now you've got only on your heading one pink text, red background, and it kind of looks like, you know, like a like a little red block that I've cut through the shapes of the letters. So we'll do, you'll do one more thing here, then we'll take a break. Try to recall from previously, um, see if you can figure this out. Previously we looked at, well, there's two, this text is way too close to the edge of that color. We talked about a CSS property previously to allow us to give us a little more breathing room between the letters and the color. Try to see if you remember how that was done, and then take a break. It's 7.15, and when we come back at 7.25, we'll proceed. So we'll take a 10 minute break once you get that to work. If you don't, we'll do it right after the break. We'll be back at 725. Say again, what